Okay, my friends, here it is. The video that is going to explain to you everything you need to know in order to successfully grow a bounty of squash and melons and honeydew and cantaloupe. All of that stuff grows with similar requirements, so we're going to lump it all together, and I'm going to show you in this video. So I'm going to say some things about it, and then I'm going to take you into the field and show you exactly what I'm talking about so that you can understand the principles and then custom tailor them to custom tailor it to whatever uh, uh, conditions and materials that you have available. So first thing we have to understand is what do the squash and melon plants need? First thing is they need high fertility. They are very hungry feeders. And so we want to be adding plenty of the rich organic matter in the form of manures. Any kind of manure is going to be useful. Also compost if you don't have the manures. Leaf mold can work, but it's not nutrient rich enough. Uh, by itself. So really try to go for some compost or some uh, manures of any kind, okay? Cow manure and horse manure are going to be the best. Uh, second thing is that the squash and melons love heat. They love the heat. And here's where I see most people go wrong. They want to start too early and to try to get a jump on the season. Uh, and then they put the plants out and it's just kind of cool. The soil's still cool or cold and it's still kind of damp and overcast. And the plants don't do well and they start to yellow or they, get, they start to get diseases early on uh, because they want it to be nice and warm. So when you plant the squash or the melons by seed, we always try to plant them direct seeding. They, you will have the most abundance by direct seeding them. Uh, when we do that, we want them to poke their head above the surface and then get full sun. The soil's nice and warmed up and everything's nice and hot. They can take wet, extreme heat a lot better than extreme cool. And that is why I'm making this video now, because you still have plenty of time to get a squash and watermelon patch set up. Because here in northern Indiana, we don't even plant, or I don't even plant them until June 1st. Because you want the soil to be nice and warm, so give it time. But here's the third thing, and what most people don't understand is that they always want a cool root system. And so, for that reason, I see a lot of people failing, trying to grow the squash or the melons and things like that because they will do it in a container or they'll do it just with bare earth in the, the root zone or they'll try to do it in a raised bed where the sun is cooking the root zone. That's not going to work for most plants, but definitely not for the squash and, and the, um, the melons because here's why. The squash and melons have a very vigorous root system. The root system of the squash and melons... Uh, like of a Tahitian melon squash, that the vine can be 20 to 30 feet long, then it's going to have a root system, a, a tapping a, a, um, a tap root that goes down about six to eight feet into the earth. But then it's going to have also numerous uh, uh, side fibrous roots, and those are going to spread out between five and 10 feet or more in every direction. So the actual area uh, of the root system can be 20 feet across or more. And that is why, uh, and see, and all of the roots that are on that whole 20 feet are within the first foot of soil. That's how it does it. It puts down one long tap root like that, but then it puts down tons of fibrous roots all in the first foot of soil. And it spreads out like that. So a lot of people think that they can confine the stuff to small little containers and get the best results, which you will get some results growing them in containers, yes. But if you grow them in the earth, you will get the full bounty of what it can do and the full nutrient density of the food. So let us just get into it. And I'm going to show you some of the uh, exact footage of what we did down in Tennessee. And this is going to be an ideal plot. Now, you don't have to use this exact system, but you, you can understand the principle and then you can custom tailor it to fit your needs based upon on your area and based upon whatever resources you have available because remember the number one goal is to be growing the maximum amount of food using what we have available so let us get into it and then we're going to come back and i'll answer a few of the questions that i know you'll be having okay first thing we got to do is de-establish whatever grasses are already there this was last fall when i went down for an initial consultation and recommended that we till this plot because that's the only way we could get rid of the grass in an almost immediate amount of time so we de-establish what is there and then we're going to add some fertility we had access to composted chicken manure you can use any kinds of manures or compost whatever you have abundantly available but here's the next step and most important we want to plant a cover crop so we're going to use crimson clover here and for all of this setup, taking all the factors into consideration, we're going to use this as a green manure crop. And so here we are in the fall planting this. We raked it in real gentle like this. And we're going to let that grow 
uh, all over the winter time. And so here we are almost six months later, I came back and you can see the crimson clover is well established, two feet tall. And it's very nice and thick and vigorous. And this is gonna make a fantastic green manure crop full of nutrients. And we're getting it right at the right time because you see the crimson clover here has started to flower but not yet gone to seed because if we did this and it had gone to seed, there'd be all kinds of little black seeds in our hand, but there are none. So right now is the time that we are going to till it in and this is the last time the soil is gonna be tilled because we're using this as a green manure. Remember, that is the technique where we grow an abundant crop and then we till it into the soil so that it can break down over the season and feed the micronutrients or the microorganisms and supply the plant with everything that it needs. Then immediately we lay down our mulch. And in this case, we chose a very large piece of heavy duty black plastic. That's what's gonna work best for this situation. And then we had some excess of old spare lumber. So we made some beds, four feet by four feet. Jenny manufactured them for us. And we're gonna take those uh, wooden frames and we're gonna place those onto the tarp like this, spaced about 10 to 15 feet apart, if you have the space. And then we cut a square out of the inside of each one, cut it down the sides like this so that we could fold over the tarp and then we're gonna staple it abundantly to the actual wood on the front and on the back. And this is gonna make it very secure so that the stuff is not blowing away. So that we end up with something like this. We have a bunch of these nice uh, framed beds, four by four, and there's gonna be zero weeds growing up in between them. And the only thing we have to focus on is what is right here. And so we're gonna have beds all the, along the center like that. And then along the edges, we're going to place large boards or rocks or logs, something like that. Here we stapled it and then we're gonna roll it over itself a couple of times to really weight it down good. Now for the fertility, we're gonna add additional fertility in the form of some of this really good cow manure. And uh, this stuff is gonna be really rich in nutrients and bursting with microbial life. So we're gonna take an ample amount of it uh, and we're gonna put it into each bed. And so, because we only have four by four spaces, that's all that you really need to worry about. So we're gonna put a nice four to six inch layer of the cow manure. And you can use any kind of manures. But then next, we had an abundant supply of this cypress mulch left over from an old project. And so we weren't using it, and so we're gonna utilize that. Likewise, you could use leaf mold, grass clippings, straw, whatever it is. You just wanna make sure that the something insulates the uh, manures from drying out. And this is gonna become a haven for all kinds of earthworms and microorganisms. They are gonna love it, my friends. Then when you go to plant, all you gotta do is gently scoot aside the mulch like this. And you can see a very distinct layer of manure or compost or whatever it is that you're using for fertility uh, but then there's also a layer of the uh, mulch on top of that and it's important this layering system so we have it like this but we always plant into the actual soil underneath all of it that's very important you don't plant into the mulch or the manure you plant into the soil underneath and so we're gonna plant our squash, our watermelon, we're gonna plant whatever it is, about five of them in each one of these holes. And then about a month later, we're gonna come back and thin to the strongest one out of each hole. And uh, here is what it's gonna look like, my friends. Okay guys, so we finished the watermelon patch here and we've got the Florida Giants, we've got the Colds Gem, 100 plus pound watermelons out of this. We also got the Colds Gem here and uh, we got the cantaloupe here because we like that nice flesh. Uh, one of the most uh, nourishing and nutritious of all of the melons. And then here is the honeydew. So once these things sprout, we are not gonna have to water or do anything because we got that layer of horse manure, we got that cover crop green manure that we tilled in, and uh, then we got the mulch on top. So this is gonna be as carefree as a watermelon squash patch could possibly get. Okay, so there's two questions I know that a lot of you already have. So one of them is, how does the uh, soil get water underneath the tarps? And two, how do you amend the soil? Well, contrary to popular understanding, water does not just come from the rain. So from most of the United States, like in Indiana, Tennessee, the East Coast, most of the United States, except for the really dry regions, there is a uh, bountiful supply of underground water. And the plant and the soil actually will draw the water up through capillary action and because the plastic is there or whatever heavy mulch you're using it limits the evaporation in the case of the plastic it can't evaporate and so it all stays there and so even in the driest drought i've used this technique for many years and even in the driest drought you will lift up that plastic and you will see it is moist under there and so the plants have a good supply of nice cool uh moisture
Second question is how do we amend the soil at the, at the end of the year? Well, the number one method is we just cut off the vines at the ground level and we leave the roots. Do you remember that root system I was talking about earlier? Well, all of those miles and miles of tiny little fibrous roots and all of that is going to remain in the soil and decompose and become food for all the microbes. So it's going to feed and nourish the soil all winter long. And then when we go to plant again, right back into the same thing, we'll add some more cow manure or uh, uh, compost, whatever it is. And and we're just going to let it go again. It works wonderful like this, my friends. So uh, custom tailor it to your exact setup. So there you go, my friends. If you feel like you gained something from the video, give it a thumbs up. Also share the video with anyone that needs the knowledge and share your thoughts. First thing that comes to mind, just leave a comment, share your thoughts and uh, check out the links in the description, all kinds of good stuff. We also have a uh, live Q&A on this channel every Saturday at 12 noon Eastern time where you can bring all your garden related questions and check out the Garden Like a Viking Instagram where I'm doing daily um, uh, reels and, and updates on the stories and stuff like that. Everything I post on social media has a purpose so you can count on that. See you next time my friends.